Okay, we are now streaming. And good afternoon, everyone. This is the House Judiciary Committee. Um, welcome. Uh, we've got two bills on our agenda today. One is uh, Senate Bill 834. The other is Senate Bill 911. Um, both are in the uh, labor law area. Um, unfortunately, Senator Smith cannot be with us um, because he's working on police reform in Judicial Proceedings Committee. But we have excellent witnesses that will be able to present um, for him. And I'll sort of start. Um, I think House Bill or Senate Bill 834 is very important. It actually alters the statutory definition of harassment relating to employment discrimination, and it explicitly includes sexual harassment within the definition of harassment. Um, and there are a couple of other provisions um, of the bill that bring us sort of in line with several other states that have changed the definition um, regarding sexual harassment and takes out a provision that provides needs it to be a severe and pervasive um, pattern. With that, um, I don't know which one would like to go first, Ms. Hughes or Ms. Siri, who are the two experts. And then we also have Lisa Jordan, who will be able to discuss the bill as well. So with that, uh, Ms. Hughes, would you like to start? Sure, thank you, um, Vice Chair, um, and to the committee. Uh, thank you for having me this opportunity this afternoon to speak on this bill. Um, Senate Bill 834 as amendment is a bill that uh, does a, a few things. Uh, first, it um, um, in uh, our the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights, and I forgot to introduce myself, General Counsel for the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights. And we are the enforcement agency for um, the state government article Title 20, in which this piece of legislation is um, in. And um, there is a definition for harassment in uh, Title 20, but this um, gives more meat to it and clarifies it in terms of including um, uh, the, the components that define harassment. Plus it also removes the definition of sexual harassment out of the state, and it's the state pension, personnel and pension article and places it into Title 20, um, which does not have a definition of sexual harassment, and um, which is important uh, since we do enforce and investigate complaints of sexual harassment and we, uh, Title 20 never had a definition about sexual harassment, so we followed case law. Um, the, 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 the definition, of the, the two definitions as amended uh, provide much more clarity as to what is harassment as it applies to other protected class and what is sexual harassment uh, and, the and the two types of, her of, of harassment. Um, it provides um, better guidance for employers and for employees who may be victims of sexual harassment as to what the parameters are. And it removes the, the higher burden of having to establish severe or pervasive and hostile and abuse um, work environment, um, placing the uh, analysis on the totality of the circumstances that a reasonable person looking at the, the facts that occur in each individual case, as opposed to adding on additional bars for persons who are um, harassed to have to climb. And um, it provides clarity for the commission in terms of our investigators being able to have uh, definition and a um, much simpler uh, means of doing the analysis when the complaints are filed and we're able to conduct our investigations um, in terms of looking at uh, quid pro quo harassment, which is something for something, or the hostile work environment where the person is being harassed and it makes it very difficult for that person to do their job. Uh, and so in, for those reasons, the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights asked for a, a favorable report on uh, Senate Bill 834 as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. We'll take all the witnesses and then we'll go to any questions there may be. So Ms. Siri. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Michelle Siri. I am the Executive Director of the Women's Law Center of Maryland. As you all know, we are one of the only 
um, operators of a statewide employment law hotline and I myself, uh, my background and my legal background is doing employment law. Just as a little bit of background on this legislation, um, I'm sure you all are familiar, there's two avenues of recourse for employment discrimination. One is through Title VII federal laws or Title 20 of the state government article through state laws. Under either of those, an employee has to exhaust their administrative remedies before filing a complaint with, by filing a complaint with either the EEOC or the MCCRs, as Ms. Hughes just explained. And what's important is under both laws, it is currently already illegal to sexually harass someone or harass someone based on their status in a protected class. That's, this law does not change that. Um, and even under the changes of this bill, which Ms. Hughes, I think, described really well the four things that it really does, an employee would still have to prove the harassment was unwelcome and, un and offensive and that it created an unreasonably abusive or hostile work environment. Um, and, and furthermore, for harassment alone, employees still would have to prove that the harassment was based upon their status in a protected class. So this does not, and I really want to make it very clear, this does not create a civility requirement. It does not require it does not create a, a straight up anti-bullying in the workplace statute. So it doesn't address any of those things. It's still narrowly tailored to the, the um, protected classes for harassment or the prid quo, prid quo, pro quo of sexual harassment, just as Ms. Hughes described. So that does not change. And I, I just really wanna make sure that that's clear. So why do we need to get rid of severe or pervasive then? Well, because the courts have been following case law that goes back at least to the eighties, maybe even earlier than that. Um, to a time when the workforce looked and felt a lot different than it does today. When there was a lot of more locker room talk that was tolerated and acceptable. And those cases that have developed through the, that time have created an unacceptably narrow standard for courts to find yeah. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. The results have been shocking. And I really implore you to read the testimony from the National Women's Law Center, the Metro Washington oh, yeah. Employment Law Association and PASA and others for examples of cases of, that have been kicked out of court for failing to meet this standard. This includes cases where an employer told the employee she should be spanked every day, commented on the length of her skirt and measured it, and then repeatedly told her that a woman as attractive as she is shouldn't be permitted to work in a prison facility. Yet the court threw that case out because the harassment wasn't severe or pervasive enough. And another thing I wanna make clear is that changing the standard does not mean that the court is going to find in the employee's favor necessarily. All it means is that the case won't automatically get thrown out in a preliminary motion to dismiss or summary judgment motion. So in that case I just mentioned, that case never got a chance to go to a jury. It never got a chance for a trier of fact to hear all of the evidence and make a decision. And that's what this would allow. It wouldn't necessarily make it happen. It would just give people their chance at, at having a full trial and having things heard. It's letting the jury or the trier of fact decide. The second part I wanna to touch on very quickly is clarification of the totality of the circumstances. This is really already federal law and it should be the way that Maryland courts interpret the standard, but there are concerns about cases where someone is being harassed, uh, both because they're being harassed because of race and they're being sexually harassed because of their gender. And the courts were looking at those cases as two, as, as those, at those as two separate incidents that had nothing to do with one another. And so obviously that's not the intent. And we at this point are all pretty familiar with the intersectionality of, of our issues and of discrimination and, and that we understand that nothing happens in a vacuum. So this would clarify that as well. So in sum, this is really about updating our statute to reflect the world that we live in right now doesn't create new law, it doesn't create new burdens on employers. And in fact, I would argue that it actually clarifies what the expectations are. So as an employer myself, who would have to, who would be subject to this law, I would have a lot more clarification as to what would be expected of me if I have someone come to me and say, my supervisor is harassing me or my supervisor sexually harassed me. Um, and you'll see from the original submission of the bill that there were several informational testimonies filed as well as uh, favorable with the amendment, including my own. But we worked really hard with uh, with the chair, with the sponsor um, on, on this together throughout the session. And we think the final version is a really strong bill that everyone can get behind. I'd also like to point out that uh, both JPR and the Senate voted unanimously in favor of this. And that being said, I'm happy to turn this over to the rest of the proponents or to answer any questions from the committee. But I do urge a favorable report on SB 834. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Jordan. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lisa Jordan with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault here in strong support of Senate Bill 834. Much of what I would say 
uh, has already been spoken to by Ms. Hughes and by Ms. Siri. I, I will just emphasize again, you know, I, I'm also an employer. Nonprofits are, are small businesses. I have 25 employees. I did have a sexual harassment case at one point that we had to deal with. I think that this bill would have to, uh, would really have clarified things. And just to illustrate the sort of issue that we're concerned about, consider this case where a supervisor frequently went into the restroom with with his employee, locked the door, said alone at last while approaching the employee, ask about the, the employee's dating life, whether the employee had had sex with anyone over the weekend, commented on the physical appearance of the employee, one time took a, a magnifying glass over the employee's crotch and said, where is it? Where is it? and bumped into the plaintiff on another occasion saying, you only do that so you can touch me. One time confining himself with the employee in a dark room saying, was it as good for you as it was for me? And then try to get close to the, the employee when leaving that dark room. This behavior continued over a seven year period and it was not severe or pervasive enough. This is the sort of case law that we're saying, times have changed, whatever has or hasn't happened in the past, let's make things clear for the employees, make things clear for the employers, have good language in our code that you can look up as an employer, you can look up as an employee and say, here is what, what's expected. It's a reasonable person standard. It doesn't have to be severe or pervasive. And it's the totality of the circumstances. This is good, solid legislation, lots of different opinions coming together and compromising. So for those reasons, the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault urges a favorable report on Senate Bill 834. Thank you very much. And that is uh, concludes the testimony. Are there questions? All right, seeing none, thank you all very much. And that will conclude the hearing on um, Senate Bill 834. We will now move to Senate Bill 911. And again, unfortunately, Senator Smith cannot be here today um, because of his other position in the legislature. Um, so just as a short summary, this bill, as it's amended, increases the limitations on the amount of compensatory and punitive damages that may be awarded to a plaintiff in cases of unlawful employment practices. The bill also, one, increases from two years to three years the amount of back pay that might be awarded in a case, and two, increases from two years to three years the time within which a person may file a civil action in a circuit court after the alleged unlawful employment practice. The increase in the statute of limitations is really just to bring it in line with other statute, other harassment cases. Um, and the increase that you'll see in the Senate bill uh, as amended um, increases the compensatory damages amount, partly because there, they haven't been increased since 2007. Um, and so this really just computes in such a way that the value, the statutory amount is now consistent with $2,021 instead of $2,007. Um, so that's a summary of the bill. And then we'll go back to sort of our same witnesses. And actually, Ms. Hughes, we'll start with you again. Or did she leave? She, um, oh, I'm still here. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I think the others left, but I'm still here. No, I, okay, they might have, but all right. No, no problem. Um, uh, uh, Senate Bill 911 is a bill that um, one wants to balance out the statute of limitations because under our statute, um, harassment, uh, the, um, the statute of limitations for harassment only was increased from two to three years. Um, so this bill would all protected classes would have the same amount of time for civil litigation to file um, in terms of the, of the statute of limitations. So that makes that equitable. And, and as um, um, was uh, reported, that it does make the adjustment um, to the um, remedy, the monetary remedy um, in terms of uh, 2000, 2000, $2,021 from the $2,007 
it does <clears throat> retain the, um, the amount based on the size of the employer. That does not change. Um, it just simply adjusts the amount uh, per size of employer to $20, $21. And, um, and then provides a provision, a 5% uh, provision to keep it, um, to maintain um, uh, the level uh, year by year of what the amount, the fair equitable amount would be for damages. Again, this is not like a traffic ticket that person files a complaint and they get the damages. No, they, they first have to prove that they have been discriminated against and then they have to prove that what the amount of damages. All this is that uh, a, a person who works for, for a specific size employer um, can get damages up to a certain amount, but that doesn't mean they will actually get that cap. They have to prove that they are, they have suffered harm that would give them that cap. So none of that changes. It is just an attempt to bring the, um, the, the, the cap, the, the dollar amount uh, to the level that it would be in 2021 uh, without changing any other parts of our statute in terms of, of relief. Thank any you very much. And I believe that concludes the oral testimony. Are there any questions from Ms. Hughes or I'll certainly try and address a question if I can. Um, Delegate Howard. Yeah, so there's no sunset on that cap that's in perpetuity. It is an impact of piece I should have mentioned is the way the bill is was amended. Um, it also includes sort of an annual increase. Um, so yeah, to come back. Yeah, five um, percent per year right. starting on October twenty first. Is there is that for the next three years or is that for the next twenty three years? Uh, it, there is not a sunset on the bill. Okay, so it goes up by five percent every year. Right, which is also consistent with what happens with compensatory damages in tort cases. Okay, that was my next automatic question. There is an automatic right. adjustment on it's, the it's caps. It's consistent with that, but is it consistent with it with, uh, percentage-wise? I'm going to have to look it up. I don't okay. Know, certain. Okay. So I think it is, but I haven't looked at that statute in a while. Okay. And, and the reason for, and it's not a concern, I'm just asking you. Right. Like, like Ms. Hughes said, they have to prove to get to that. Mm -hmm. But in three or four years, that cap is going to be a lot greater. So whereas today to get to the cap would be, or next year would be mm -hmm. 6,000, three years from that would be, you know, 75, 85,000. Okay. I will look at sort of what the cap is on the economic damages for um, compensatory damages and the tort claim. I just think it would be, that would be appropriate that it would be in line. Okay. I'll look at that. Okay. And I would note, just so that you know, the bill came in getting rid of all caps. Yeah. So putting the cap in was actually um, the work of the Senate. Yeah, I just, okay. Thank you. All right, I'll find out for you and I'll get back to you. Okay. Delegate Valerian. So, Delegate Valerian. To follow up with, you know, Delegate Howard says it, it, it's a little different than the scenario that I, I've seen in the past where our state's attorney had a guaranteed percentage raise long before he ever got into office. And he actually had to come into the delegation and said, this has to stop. My salary is outrageous because of these increases that went on. So a 5% increase, never ending, it might as well be, you know, in, in 10 years, that, that's going to be out of control. In 20 years, it's really going to be out of control. So, um, I mean, if we're going to have a cap, it should be a lock cap. And if they need to come back for additional, then they come back for additional. But to just continue to add to this and add to this and add to this, I think that's out of control. And while it may not seem a lot next year and a year after that, 10 years down the road, it's going to look like something much different. And, um, you know, I, I can't support something. I, I think it would be good if we could amend this before it goes back to just lock it at the cap. And if they want to come back for additional, you know, in four or five years, I'm going to come back for that. And that, that's my comment on that. And I have seen it get out of control with that. Okay. All right. Other comments or questions? All right. Seeing none, then that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 911. Um, and it actually concludes our bill hearings for today. 
And as the email from um, Ms. Waters indicated, we are going to have a voting session this afternoon. We assume that it'll be around 2.30. Um, I'm sure that uh, Ms. Waters will send you all a link. What it depends on is sort of when the chairman gets back um, from uh, finance where he is presenting a bill. So stay tuned, watch your emails, and we'll let you know when we the voting session is going to occur. And with that, I think we are done with bill hearings for today. And um, everybody have a nice afternoon at least.